just uh, this is a uh, 11th session of our distance learning ideas from the field series. Uh, this one is focused on uh, distance learning and correctional facilities. And actually, when we first started this, this series, uh, in the first couple of webinars that we did, we had a lot of folks that uh, attended those webinars and said, you know, I'm working in a correctional facility, so all the things that people are doing with Zoom and WhatsApp and uh, a lot of the different technologies, I can't do in my facility. Can you do one that specifically focuses on correctional facilities and operating in correctional facilities? So we've spent some time uh, recruiting some panelists. We've got three great panelists today, um, or four panelists from three institutions. Um, and I think they're going to give you kind of a, a variety of perspectives of the things that you might be able to do in your own facility. And we're going to try something that we haven't done before. It was, we're going to try to give folks, if you're doing something different in your facility, an opportunity to share. So we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. As always, we are recording. Uh, you'll receive a follow-up email, not on Monday this time, on Thursday. I have to be out of the office early next week, so I won't be able to compile everything and get that follow-up email out until Thursday. So if you don't receive an email on Monday like you normally would, don't fret. Uh, but Thursday, it'll come out. It'll have a link to the recording. It'll have uh, the PowerPoints that folks are uh, using today. We'll provide that electronically to you. It'll have a link to websites that people are using as resources, as well as a chat transcript, the Q&A file, and a certificate for those of you who are attending. A little bit about how we're gonna function today. Uh, for questions, we're gonna ask that you use the chat room uh, to post any technical issues that you're having. And also, if you there are links that you want to share, you can post those in the chat. It's easy for us to pick up on those after the webinar. Uh, any websites that get mentioned by our panelists, we'll try to post into the chat room. Uh, we're going to ask that you use the Q&A feature to ask questions of the presenters. Uh, that Q&A feature helps us kind of keep track of what questions have been answered. And uh, all of the presenters have agreed to kind of stick around after the webinar is over at the top of the hour. We'll stop taking questions, but they'll stick around and we'll make sure that everybody's questions get uh, answered. As I said, we're uh, going to invite some people. We're going to try this out, invite people to share what they're doing in their correctional facility. We're going to ask you to only share if you're doing something different than what the uh, folks on the panel are talking about. So uh, we want to be respectful of people's time and there's 360 or so people attending. So if you're doing something unique, uh, we want to invite you to share what you're doing just for a couple of minutes. Uh, we're going to do that by raising your hand. So you should see on your controls or by clicking on the participants on your controls and a pop-up window should pop up and you should see either a blue hand that you can click on to raise your hand or maybe a raise hand button and if you're on your phone you should be able to swipe over to the participant screen where you see the participants listed and raise your hand so after our panelists get finished presenting we'll invite a couple of people to Share if you want, raise your hand, you'll go to the top of the list. We'll call on you, we'll unmute you. You can talk very briefly about what you're doing. Uh, if you want to be available to people to reach out to you uh, after the webinar is over to find out more, uh, you can post your contact information in the chat room and then that will get shared with people uh, when we share the webinar recording. So we'll see how that goes, if it's working well, We'll keep doing it. If it's not working well, we'll kind of switch back over to the, um, we'll switch back over to just the uh, Q&A portion. Uh, so a little bit about uh, kind of moving forward. We've been doing these webinars on a weekly basis uh, since uh, the beginning of April. 
So we're going to take July off. So there's not going to be any webinars in July. We're going to take that time to kind of recalibrate, regroup, uh, expand the webinars that we're offering a little bit, and then we'll pick back up in August. So if you've attended any of these webinars, your name will be on our mailing list, and you'll get an email invitation to the webinars when they uh, pick back up. And just to remind everybody, we send out links to the recording of the webinars, but if you want to find uh, those recordings, you can also find them on Pro Literacy Education Network. You see the uh, link to the uh, website there. It's our, it's our Pro Literacy's uh, uh, resource website. We have a special collection of distance learning resources that we've uh, put together so you'll those are easily accessible. You'll see a big banner once you create an account and log on. Uh, almost everything on the website is free. We post the recordings there as well. And if you have any questions about that, you can email me. There's my email address there. And now, without further ado, let me introduce our uh, presenters for today. Uh, we're going to start with Allison Austin who's the program manager for Washtenaw Literacy, and they run a literacy program with the Washtenaw County Jail. Then we're gonna move on to Karen Davis. She's an ABE instructor and runs a program in a uh, psychiatric correctional hospital. And then finally, we're gonna have Tom Connolly and Dr. Olga Lopez, both of which are with the Virginia Department of Corrections. So they're facilitating distance learning on a statewide level and kind of uh, uh, farming it out or sending it out to uh, the local correctional facilities around their state. They're going to talk about kind of how they're handling that. So try to get kind of a mixture of uh, folks in different environments and to, to hit kind of everybody's experiences. So I'm going to start by unmuting Allison. Allison, can you? Yes. Uh, all right. You're ready to go, so I'm going to move to your first slide here. Terrific. Thank you. Hi, I'm Allison Austin with Washtenaw Literacy. We're in Washtenaw County, Michigan, and we run um, programming in our county jail. I am the program manager um, for Washtenaw Literacy, and if you joined last week, you will recognize my voice. Happy to be with you today. Go ahead, Todd. So in our county jail, I'm looking at the blue section of this slide because you've heard about Washington literacy before, right? So in our county jail, we were tutoring on site three days a week in a large meeting room and did ABE, GED. We had some ESL students, um, a wide variety of inmates that we were working with. Typically, we'd have five to seven tutors at a two-hour session. Um, and those two-hour sessions, again, were three days a week. And we'd have anywhere from 50 to 20 inmates. The facility, the actual county jail, um, houses anywhere from three to 500 inmates at a time. So it's a fairly large facility. Um, but we were serving those lowest level learners, those folks that are at or below the eighth grade level equivalent. Most of the inmates in our jail are there for 24 hours to one year, um, depending on their situation. And unfortunately, it is a facility where absolutely no technology is allowed. Um, we can't even bring our phones or our tablets or anything into the facility. So everything is paper and pen and very kind of old fashioned. So that was our pre-COVID. Now onto what we are doing these days. So we are preparing packets, which we send electronically to a corrections officer and that corrections officer prints and distributes the materials. For those tutors who were working with students pre-COVID, they are continuing to prepare packets for those same students. So they had some established relationship, some idea of where those students were at and what those students needed, and were continuing to support those students. 
We do have some new inmates that we're working with who obviously we have far less information about, um, but we're just trying to gauge their needs based on what the correctional officers have been able to share with us and also from the completed work. So you'll see we do get completed work back from our students also electronically. And we're able to look at that work and help plan our next session and our next packet based on the work that was done and the kind of formative assessment that we're able to do by looking at the work that was returned to us. Now, honestly, <laughs> some of the inmates never return work. But some of them have been really good about it and have been really excited about that opportunity to sort of interact with the outside world a little bit. Our jail is looking to find some non-internet connected tablets that they might use, but that's still so up in the air. And our greatest concern has been our lowest level students. Probably 75% of the inmates that we were working with are at about a second or third grade reading level. And so this idea of electronic packets is kind of meh. Doesn't so much work for somebody that really needs help with phonics and is at such a low level that they're struggling to do anything independently and they really need a support system there. So we've begun creating short little video lessons that the officers can play on the block and anybody can engage in them that wants to. Um, the, any of the folks that are sort of shy about doing that do have the opportunity to see the presentation or the video from a small classroom. Each one of our blocks has a small classroom that is attached. So if they want privacy or if they want quiet, the corrections officer can let them into that classroom to watch the video that also gives them the opportunity to watch the same video multiple times, um, which seems to be helpful. But we're still at the beginning stages of the video process, so not quite sure um, how that's going to turn out and how that's going to work long term. We're just trying it out and testing it for now. So I wanted to give you some examples of materials that we're using. Um, we are sending readings with comprehension and main idea kinds of questions, lots of vocabulary exercises. We actually have found those to be the things that the inmates are most willing and interested in participating in at this time. Not sure why that is, but they're loving the close exercises that kind of fill in the blank things or a lot of the matching exercises that we're doing. We even did get a couple of learners who have been um, playing memory. So we sent some vocabulary flashcards that they could cut up themselves or tear up and then be able to like play memory or concentration on their own. And several have reported really liking that. We've also gotten a lot of engagement in the writing prompts that we've been sending. I think people just really want an opportunity to express themselves and to share with the outside world. So lots of different materials. Um, the one thing I wanna mention down here at the bottom of the slide, we are engaging our tutors as much as possible in this. They were really active and excited about all of the tutoring that they were doing in our jail. And we didn't want this, this situation to kind of leave them out where suddenly staff took over. So we created a Slack platform where our tutors could collaborate together, pulling together all of these materials and packets every week and even sharing with each other what they were sending to their particular learners so that they could get ideas from each other and kind of brainstorm or crowdsource even some creative solutions to things. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing. I've got my contact information on the last slide here. So feel free to contact me if you'd like more information. It's a pretty simple plan at this point because we are so limited um, in this particular facility with what we can do. And I will say that they have had very few inmates 
who have been COVID positive, but they have had a lot of staff that are COVID positive. So unfortunately, they have been running at a super minimum staff level throughout this time. And therefore, the officers themselves have been able to offer us very little contact or information. It is just send an email with the stuff and they hit print. And that's about the most that we're going to get. So thank you much for your time. Um, hope that gave you a couple of ideas for a really limited resourced county jail opportunity. Thank you, Allison. And let me just uh, say a couple of things about uh, kind of housekeeping things. One is we will include uh, folks um, <clears throat> contact information with uh, the stuff we send out uh, in the follow up email on Thursday. And we're going to hold off on questions until after all of the panelists have finished, and then we'll come back and uh, pose your questions to one or more of the panelists. So thank you. Okay, thanks again, Allison. And next up is Karen Davis. So Karen, can you speak so I can make sure you're unmuted? I'm here. Perfect. And there we go. Hi, everybody. First, I want to thank Todd and everybody at the Pro Literacy team for having me. It's, this is truly an honor, and, and I'm super excited to share anything that I can with everyone out there. Um, I am an adult basic education instructor for Chesapeake College, which is located in several different areas, but the main campus is in Y Mills. Uh, the other major area is in Cambridge, Maryland, which is my site where I work out of. Um, I'm one of many that are currently digital, and our college is actually not going back to in-face until 2021. So our team has really worked hard on how we can continue to give back to the community. Like our previous speaker, I started with packets. Um, I am working in a psychiatric correctional facility, so it's all of the same technical issues that you would have in a prison setting. Um, but there are some additional issues due to their uh, psychiatric needs. So everything I do, I have to be very mindful of that. Um, again, I wasn't able to be face-to-face -face, uh, for quite a while. So I just was sending packets and getting back what I got back. Um, and I was really pushing my, my team and my supervisors and the staff at the hospital to try to find a way around it. So we came up with a plan through Google Meets. So what I've been doing is sending PowerPoint slides to a staff member. And then while one staff member is showing the slides, we are meeting through one Chromebook between me and the students on Google Meets. So you can go ahead to the next slide. Okay. And Karen, we're having some people say that they're uh, having a hard time hearing you. So if you could uh, uh, speak up, speak a little is bit louder. Better? Much better. better. Okay. I'm usually told not to be so loud, so I'll take it. <laughs> um, so everything that I'm showing you is less about the specific and how I'm do doing it. It's more of the why. Um, I think it's very important for the students uh, to keep a good organized lesson like we were in person. And I try to utilize the space they're in, although it's digital. Um, to create it as if I was in the room. So I follow the very same set of format that I would if I'm in the classroom, which always starts with our goals for the day or for the couple weeks that we see each other. We, right now we're one time a week. Um, that varies between one to one and a half hours. We're trying to get more hours in. Um, I create my to-do list. And then as items come on and off the list, I move them around. So this is a sample of our today, this is actually today's uh, to-do list for the lesson I was just finishing with them um, earlier today. Um, I think it's important to explain the first one because what I'm trying to do is modify their think time. So we've gotten to the habit where the very first thing we do is a journal entry and I click think, write, read, and respond, where they have to take one minute and think about their glow and growth for the week. And we, this is something we've built on every week. Um, I don't like to use the word negative, so I don't do positive and negatives because I never want them to feel like their experiences throughout the week are negative or put that word out there. So I'm always talking about growing opportunities. What could you have done better? What do you want to improve? It doesn't have to be educational. This is really a chance for us to connect 
and we go over any questions from previous assignments. Um, I add anything new that we're doing into the list. And so this is a preview of our Today We Will. All right, Todd, next slide. Um, also, before I get started, I think it's very important to do a quick checklist, which is our routines and expectations. Um, review the technology, make sure it's working. There have been instances where I can hear them or they can't hear me. And so I've had to instruct them how to use the chat box, um, how to use you know, closed caption through the Google Meets, and they're not allowed to actually touch the Chromebook they're sharing with me. So staff has to be involved. And so I try to involve the staff on everything that we're doing because really without them, none of this would be possible. I also want to make sure we have all of the materials that we need it for the lesson. Okay, thanks, Todd. Um, this is the, the, the slide that I do for my Grow and Glow. Um, I, I try to teach a little bit of a formal writing in everything I do. So for me, it's very important that they date everything they're doing and that they're starting with thinking before they write and then they give, get time to write. And I do time that for two minutes because I want to teach them that there is some going to be instances where writing is time. Um, and then we uh, share out. Um, this delineates me from doing all the teacher talking and it gets them stopping, thinking, writing, and then sharing out without me having to do hardly any talking. Okay, next slide. Um, today we worked on uh, measurements, the Khan Academy video. Those are huge for me because they're really helpful. Um, and I had previously sent the worksheet the previous week. So uh, we pulled that back up and we, that was their homework. Next slide. And this was a, I copied and pasted this in so we could have a digital version on the PowerPoint of some problems. Now I don't go over every problem. Um, I go over, you know, specific ones that I know were more challenging. Students also share out the ones they struggled with and why. And this just gives, again, them time to talk and me time to listen to their needs. It also allows them to kind of tell me what they think was easy and what they think was hard. And I make notes the whole time I'm teaching them in my notebook for them specifically under their names. Next slide. Um, one of the students' interest was time zones, so we've really been digging into time zones. And what I love about this is it's really gotten them to think outside of the box. Uh, I also am creating um, a persuasive essay from the articles that I have them printed off and reading. So I added a new video this week that really broke down the time zones around the world. I also included how to help the staff stop and freeze, take pictures of the screen, and use the transcript button under YouTube so that when the students have questions or need something printed out, they can tell me, I can send it, or the team right then in the moment can print things out for them, including the staff at the hospital is just vital for this to be successful. So I always try to make sure they have a job as well. Next slide. Um, brain breaks for me are huge. Now today I wasn't able to do it in the middle of the lesson because today's lesson was short so I could be here with all of you wonderful team members and I did end with my lesson with this but I was trying to do a brain break and they now know about the hemispheres of the brain, why the brain needs movement, how to cross body and today we danced to uh, funny stuff at the top. Uh, they love seeing me dance and do yoga and stretches with them through the computer. Uh, it gives it a sense of real feel. And they just think it's funny that I'm just as silly and I want them to be just as silly. And this sort of creates a comfort level while creating a real in-person experience um, that other, otherwise they wouldn't be getting. So this was just really huge for me throughout. And they look forward to this. Next slide. Uh, today we started Oreo writing. Now, I don't know if anybody's familiar, but I love reading and writing and I, I teach the Oreo method even at the graduate level and I use it at the graduate level. So this was really fun for them. Anything that's fun and digital and has pictures and words along with it, because I'm not right in the classroom is huge. So if you're going to send a PowerPoint, uh, make sure that they capture the audience's attention. Next slide. 
Um, I always like to go back and say, hey, what did we learn? What are we doing? Where are we going with this? And so this is just a quick, easy slide that I like to throw in with the topics because it's a chance for me to get them to talk. Again, less time I talk, the better they're doing. Next slide. Um, we're, our college is using um, Aztec and we've been going in now because they don't have access to their own Chromebooks. They are going in through um, their person at the hospital, whoever is the staff in that's working, and then they get their username and password in. So I'm able to use Aztec as a whole learning platform instead of the basis for individual use. I've been working very closely with Aztec. Um, I really love Aztec and everything about Aztec. So um, I just wanted to share that we are using this platform. And although they're not able to use it individually, um, there is a way to make it whole group so that they are seeing what I want them to see through the learning program. Next slide. Again, I'm always wanting them to tell me what we did. Anytime you can build that layer in cognitively, um, it's better for them. I don't want to tell them what we did. I want to hear it from them. And I'm also able to take notes on any questions or concerns. I have every class, I have pages and pages and pages of notes when I'm done. Next slide. Um, I love to, again, for me, that color green lets me know we're headed into something more math related. Uh, right now, one of my students' interest is uh, buying a house, buying a car, figuring out how to apply math to the real world. So again, this is from weeks ago, their student interest survey that I take at the end of the class, which is, is just as important as our um, grow and glow at the beginning. And they also are very open and honest with me throughout the lesson. Um, and I'm always taking notes so I can make sure I get everything in for them. So this kind of green color also indicates to them that we're going to be working with something in math. So again, it's all about presentation for them. It's got to be visually powerful to keep their attention. Because the only other person they're seeing is really on the screen is my face. So PowerPoint on one screen, me on the other. So I don't necessarily want them looking at me the whole time. So I'm really trying to capture their attention um, to the presentation itself. Next slide. So again, this is just what I do. I lay everything out very clearly for them. I want us to be very clear on what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, another thing, this helps the staff. Um, the more I layer in where things are and what we're doing to the previous can do, must do slides, the easier it is for the staff to find. And I'm always able to go, go to this number, go to that number. And sometimes it just, I try to make it flow and match the objectives. Next slide. Um, again, this is just more um, of us following the math um, and me making sure it was nice and big for note taking for them. Next slide. Uh, I really think graphic organizers are important. And since I can't be there to show for me to have a visual and a link for them to print off if they need that done for them instead of them creating their own uh, visual computer contrast aid or any other type of graphic organizers. Um, for our ABE learners, especially my pre-GED students, it is very important to teach them how to organize their thinking and what they're doing and why. This will help them improve all skills and all levels. Thank you. On the slide. So uh, again, you know, a conversation starter. So I always like to bring in what's ha currently happening. This slide used to be different pictures. I want I like to get them to talk about what's going on in the current event world. And so this was, what do you see? What do you think of when you see? And so this was, again, this was an opportunity for them to talk to me and talk to each other. Um, again, I'm really trying to push my talk time less. But unfortunately, I have to talk to you through the slide, but I promise you I try not to talk this much when I'm with my students. So I think that's really good for the slides. Um, I do want to mention one other thing. If um, you want to click through to the end, uh, something I've done to keep myself organized, if you just keep going, oh, yep, keep going, keep going. This is all stuff that I just can flip back and forth and keep going. Um, this is my closing checklist and then go to the next one. What I've started doing is saving slides. When we're done something, I put it at the end of my old PowerPoint. So this helps me in two ways. If I get a new student that comes in, 
then I can go back to what the other students have already done and it's a lot easier for me and it also keeps me organized and ordered and how we've done things and where if there's a question maybe I need to go back to a building block but it also helps me not have to rebuild the wheel for other classes so if you start really utilizing these slides and building on them if you want to click to the next slide this was a, something I started with again all about getting to know them and if you click to the very last few slides, I have a method of highlighting and unhighlighting things that we did or need to do. Keep going. These are all things we've finished. One more, one more. I know. I don't have it in front of me. So one more, and I'll show you. I use a hot, I use a, yep, there we go. So I'm using red and green. And anything that was red, we finished. Anything that, or anything that was red, we need to still do or black we need to still do. And then we had the colors for the finish. So I will be more than happy to share this slide presentation with anybody interested. Um, this is just so you guys know you're not alone and I thank you for your time. Karen, just to help people contextualize this, uh, we had some questions about the use of technology. So you have somebody in your a uh, hospital, like a, an orderly or a nurse or somebody like that, that has a Chromebook and you are sending these PowerPoints to him or her and they are showing them to the, uh, uh, the students on that Chromebook, correct? Is that how so the technology is working? We have two Chromebooks. One Chromebook's attached to um, a big slide PowerPoint, um, you know, a screen. A screen and projector. Right, and with, with uh, speakers. And so one staff member runs the PowerPoint just like you're doing for me now. And the other staff member has a Chromebook that I am face-to-face -face through Google Meets because it's secure, because it's a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. And um, they, that's what they're comfortable using. So that allows the students to see me while we're, while they're watching the PowerPoint. I also have the PowerPoint that they're watching up on my computer. Um, and yes, it, it does seem like a lot, but I love technology and I'm forcing myself to grow and grow and grow. And this was how we could make it work because they don't have their own Chromebooks. So I have to be very methodical and very, um, specific about what I want them to see doing and what I want them doing with the staff. So one staff is running the PowerPoint while the other staff is running the Google Meets Chromebook. Thank you. I think that helped people kind of contextualize um, it the stuff a lot, that you but it works. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank All right. You. So we're going to move on uh, to uh, the folks from the Virginia Department of Education and let me unmute them. Uh, let's see, there we go. Tom and Olga. Let's see, did I? Okay. Uh, Tom, are you unmuted? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you great. And Olga? I'm here. Perfect. Okay. So uh, Tom uh, Connolly and uh, Dr. Olga Lopez from the uh, Virginia Department of Corrections, and they're going to talk about um, what they've been doing. Well, thank you, Todd. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, Todd, can we go to the first uh, slide, please? Okay, uh, just to give you an idea of what we normally do, uh, Virginia Department of Corrections, we have about 43 facilities across the state. Um, we do not only do adult basic education, but we also offer uh, CTE classes. Uh, and the number of teachers that we have do vary according to the size of the facility. And also we need to take in consideration that we have some facilities that are uh, high security and then there are lower security. So everything impacts on what we do. In a regular day, we have about four class periods per day and some facilities are going for four 10 hour days, some others for five eight hour days. So depending on what schedule they have, we may have a two class hour period 
or an hour and a half class hour periods. One of the things is that all our instructors have to have a license. So they have to be licensed by the state of Virginia. Uh, our regular classrooms do have a small group instructions and then they have multiple levels. We have your, we have normally about two or three tutors, two or three tutors per class and anything between 10 to 15 students per class. So we do, we're all inclusive. So we have uh, SPED students and just different levels all together. So uh, Todd, you wanna go move on to the next slide? So, uh, so currently we are working in classrooms that, um, or in, with facilities where all, a lot of our teachers have been reassigned to meet the other needs of the institution, whether that be cooking in the kitchens, uh, taking temperatures, cleaning. Um, so a lot of our teachers have been been reassigned. So because of that, we have actually reallocated our testers, the individuals who would give um, normally test students on the GED. We have reallocated them to be support staff to create instructional packets for distance learning. Uh, these instructional packets are paper and pencil packets that we put together at three different levels for low learners, medium level learners, and, and high level learners. And we submit those to the institutions on a bi-weekly basis. So at that point, it's up to the teacher whether they want to send those packets out, how they want to send them out, or if they're going to continue to deliver their own, their own instructional packets. So that's what our uh, GED testers have been doing along with other academic staff at our, at our headquarters, um, creating those packets. Along with that, we have partnered with our mental health services unit to deliver remote video lessons. So we have teachers that are recording lessons on um, reading instruction, on math instruction, maybe it's a unit on ecology. Uh, our most recent one was on sports geometry, finding the area and perimeter of different sports fields and um, delivering videos um, that are played in closed circuit television in our institutions, uh, pods or day rooms. Also, we've uh, created videos that are brain teasers, things like that, just to kind of break up the day and, and do the best we can to deliver the um, deliver instruction to our learners. So when we do return back to normal, all the work that they have done has not been lost. And those folks who were getting ready to test their GED uh, will be able to continue uh, to, to work towards that. We've also been working on revamping our personalized learning plans in the facilities as part of our contracts with the offenders. They have to have a personalized learning plan. And we took this opportunity to really start a working dialogue with our academic staff, our principals, our teachers, to say, what do, the, what do our offenders need in the classroom? How can we get them to set their own goals? And how can we get them to learn how to plan to meet those goals? So we have uh, planned on that with training rolling out uh, later on this summer. And that hasn't been without its challenges though. Dr. Lopez is gonna talk to you a little bit about the, the challenges we've been facing. Uh, Todd, can you click to the next slide, please? Well, thank you, and you're correct. Um, so being prepared, as, as all of you may know, you know, we kind of were cut, you know, offhand. Nobody expected this. So it has been kind of like, okay, what do we do? How can we keep going? So we have created resources and that's what Tom was talking about using our testers, using some of the teachers. So what these resources are, are like packets or lessons and they come on different levels. And the reason that they come on different levels is because we do understand that some of our students are at a lower level, either on reading or on math and others at a higher. So we want, the teacher to be able to pick the area that he or she needs to provide to the student. And we also have created kind of like a sheet of paper for the teacher to keep track of how many of those packages that he's sending out to the back are coming back. So those are kind of the resources we're doing. As all of you know, budget is always an issue. And for us especially, we are at the end of our fiscal year. So that has created some issues because we don't have the monies available to buy more paper as needed or purchase other things. And we used to, on the regular classrooms, we had uh, 
Reading Horizons. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, TAPE and GED, Academy, uh, Aztec. So all those things we don't have available at the time because we do not have that uh, computers available. So on the correctional, uh, when it comes to the CTE, it's even harder because it's a lot of contact when you're either doing something with welding or you're doing something with uh, carpentry, it's a lot of hand and side by side. So those are things that we don't have. We have provided some incentives to the students, like if they uh, return the packages and they are completed, then they will count as if they were present. So therefore they do get uh, money for that. And then we're also trying to celebrate what we call the small victories, because we continue with testing, especially for those who are closer to relief. So we recently, just last week, had our uh, latest graduate, we have and this was a student who was a SPED student. So that's even more meaningful to us. And then we also have what we call a PLAZA student that is, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with PLAZA, but it is uh, something that we do with the Mexican consulate. So we're also looking at how we're gonna proceed with testing as we start moving forward. And we also maintain the special education and the ADA, and that has been a big challenge. And I think that Tom is going to tell you about some of the things we, we're, we're doing. So Tom, back to you. Yeah, Todd, can you advance the slide, please? Thank you. So uh, looking forward onto what we're going to be doing in the future of education in, in corrections. Um, you know, right now, all of our options are on the table. We don't have internet in all of our facilities. Um, and, and really, it is dependent on the security level. There's a lot of things that we are looking at to how do we deliver distance learning in a correctional educational setting? And that is the question we are trying to answer. Uh, we also have to take into consideration our offenders that are on probation and parole, and how do we offer them instruction to continue forward if they've missed all of this instruction due to the COVID pandemic? And we're looking at different options to deliver instruction to them and get them tested for, for their, their GED. Um, one thing we are looking at is Polycom for distance learning within the facilities. I believe some of that's that non-internet based tablet. Um, and, you know, what does remote and hybrid instruction look like? And, you know, I, I wish we could sit here and tell you that we know exactly what it's going to look like and we know exactly what the answer is. But like everything we found out over these last couple months, it's going to look a little bit different and in, in each facility. It's going to be challenging to pull off. It's going to take a lot of hard work. but. Um, at the Virginia DOC, we have a lot of really good people and a lot of really good minds that we're putting on it um, to figure out what's best for, for, our, for our learners. Um, so like I said, all of the options are on the table. We are looking at um, maybe alternating day schedules, sending packets back with the, with the offenders, continuing the videos in the day rooms to deliver remote instruction um, and other sorts of, of blended and hybrid instruction. Um, so um, Todd, if you wanna to go to the, the next slide, uh, this is Dr. Lopez and I's contact information. Um, if you need to get a, a hold of us um, or have any questions that do not get answered today, uh, please feel free to reach out. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And uh, let me just say, let me, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute all of our panelists as we are opening up for uh, questions and let me just kind of remind everybody again we will send out the uh, slide deck for everybody with the follow-up email on Thursday so you'll have all of this contact information uh, when you receive that um, slide deck. Um, I'm going to invite folks to who want to share what they're doing in their facility to raise their hands. I see one person has uh, done that already. While you're doing that I've got a question. One of the questions that came up was, uh, we know that a lot of times the inmates get certain uh, credits for participating in uh, education programs. Uh, so this is to kind of all the panelists. How are you guys, how are you guys able to kind of attribute whatever those uh, kind of benefits are if it's uh, uh, you know, uh, money, credits, uh, 
time off, whatever those normal uh, kinds of things are, the benefits of participating in education. How are you judging it, especially if folks are working on packets uh, independently? And Tom, let's start with you and then go to, uh, I think, Allison and then Karen. Great. I, I actually might have to tag in Dr. Lopez on this because she has been with the uh, Department of Corrections for much longer than I have. Um, but I do know that our, our offenders do get, uh, do get credit for attending school. Now, some of our facilities in the western part of our state are our maximum security facilities. So they not much has changed for them. So they have to return those packets um, in order to get, their, to get their credit. And it's also tied to their, uh, their money they receive. Um, but uh, Dr. Lopez, for the rest of the facilities, are, 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 do you know, are we still crediting them with, uh, with time and money? Yes, Tom, uh, you're correct. Uh, they, we are currently, if they are returning the packages, we consider them present. So if they are present, they get paid for as if they were attending class, which is not much, but it's, uh, it's something that they get. Also for us, uh, you know, education in Virginia, once you get into the uh, prison system, is mandatory. It's a compulsory, so they have to, by legislation and by law, attend. But they do receive, if we get the packages, they get credit as being present, so they get paid for that. So they get paid as if they had attended whatever the regular length of the class was pre-COVID. That is correct. Okay, perfect. Allison, what about you? But yes. I'm sorry, go ahead, Olga. I was just going to say they do have to return the packages, otherwise they do not count as being present. That is exactly uh, the same answer I would give. So if they return a packet, they get credit. If they return part of a packet, they get partial credit um, because our jail does count by the single hour. So even though our classes are two hours long, they get a credit for two class times. And so if they return partial packet, they get one hour credit. Okay. And um, Karen, what about you? You kind of have face-to-face uh, -face time. So is that counting the same way? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, and we, our college has implemented SIRs, uh, the student um, interaction reports. We do it digitally. I'm a big note taker, so I pretty much put every, like every 20 minute increments, everything we've done. Uh, the students do get their um, time credited for the time that we spend in class. They weren't before we, I was doing the packets because it was too hard to know who was and wasn't doing work plus they were getting sent the answers. But now that we are face-to-face, -face, um, I use the Google Meet and I also take notes on when we start, when we stop and everything that we're doing in between. So that all goes into my uh, student inter interaction reports that I then send off to my supervisory team. Okay, great. So we've got uh, three people that wanna share. So we're gonna test this out. Uh, the first is Vicki McNeese and Vicki, uh, you, let's see, um, let's see if I can unmute you. Vicki, I'm trying to unmute you. You may be able to unmute your, uh, self or actually, let me try it this way. Vicki, I'm going to go this way. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. And Vicki, you should be able to speak now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. I work in a prison unit. I'm not even allowed to wear my smartwatch or a BitFit or anything like that inside. Very few of the inmates have a tablet. I go in and do the original 12-hour law box training and train inmates to be tutors. At this time, I have no contact with any of my students or tutors and everyone as would be in a regular program, my tutors and students work at their own pace. So I have not been signing in for the distance learning 
uh, seminars because they just didn't seem to fit what I needed. And I was hoping this would give me a little better insight. And I'm kind of at a loss because I'm just hanging out here waiting for this to lift. Right. I've gotten, so I've gotten a few pointers, but uh, for when I get, can go back. But at this point, they're telling me maybe not until August. Okay, so it sounds like you are relying on uh, kind of a peer tutoring uh, setup that you had established uh, pre-COVID, and you're just relying on that mechanism to continue uh, with the inmates at their own pace until the COVID restrictions are lifted. Yes, only from what I'm hearing, they're not even allowed to meet right now. We okay. established this program 14 years ago and have been going in there on a regular basis and training tutors. And I go in once a week and we meet for anywhere from, from an hour to three hours. And I am there as a support mostly while the students and tutors meet. Okay, thank you very much, Vicki, for sharing. I'm gonna move on and uh, put you back as an attendee and call on uh, somebody else, let's go with Geraldine, and let's see if I can unmute Geraldine. Geraldine, can you unmute? There we go. Geraldine? Yes. Good afternoon. I'm with the Department of, uh, I'm at VAD OCEA as well in Virginia at Fluvanna Correctional Center. Um, I have taken so many distance courses to make sure that I'm on point with uh, the things that are possibly coming with remote and hybrid. I value it tremendously. In fact, I think in this point in time, I just had a crazy idea. I'm taking a course in CoAbe next week on peer tutoring. I had a great idea. They don't know about it yet, but uh, I, I emailed them and said, here's a, here, that you hear it first. Um, I wanna teach all of my students to be peer tutors and I want to bump up my um, enrollment because I, I'm only allowed to see uh, people from each building and they're giving me an option to use the gym. So I'm thinking about bumping up my enrollment, teaching the course uh, once a week to uh, students or maybe twice, um, getting people on board with peer tutoring for, with, with the strengths that they have I did that years ago, um, but I wanna see it on a large scale. And then I wanna also make sure that all the videos that we're creating, I wanna bump it up too and give like uh, multiple times that they could view it because I think that would give them more class time. And then we, you know, when we go to hybrid, the hybrid piece is where I'm teaching them how to tutor each other. I think, I think we're gonna explode and see wonderful things. So I've tried to look at this whole mess is something positive and I've been listening to people from all over the world what they're doing and I'm ex actually excited that we're going to have an opportunity to do some rem uh, more remote things and then make it hybrid. Perfect. Thank you, Geraldine. I think I'm going to do uh, one more uh, person and then we're going to go back to answering some more uh, questions. So uh, let's do um, is it uh, Rocio? Is that how you uh, pronounce your name? Let me unmute you. And Rocio, let's see if we can get you unmuted. Rocio, I think you may have to unmute yourself. I think I've asked, there we go. I got it. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was listening to everybody, and I work for a detention center uh, for juvenile females. And like many of the teachers, we don't have access to the internet. And we did the paperwork with the students, but it didn't really work out very well for us because 80% uh, of my students have special needs. Everybody has an IEP. And I was very interested about how can I implement the Slack platform and also about the Chrome. And I hear that 
we can get um, with the Chrome, we can get Chromes for the students and with, uh, with no access to the internet. So I would like to do that as it is in my facility. We're not allowed to bring our cell phones. We cannot bring uh, not even a um, smartwatch and the students don't have access to the internet because uh, security reasons. Okay, thank you, Rocio. Um, and um, I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if you wanna share what you're doing in your program. We're not gonna use the raising hands to ask questions, but we did have a, uh, some other folks that had questions uh, about expanding a little bit more about how you were using Slack. And I can't remember if that was Allison or Karen that was using Slack, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, so we're using Slack quite a bit. Um, and this is another example of, I had never heard of Slack in March and now I'm on Slack four hours a day, <laughs> right? We've got a Slack workspace for our staff. We also have a Slack workspace for our tutors. And so on the tutor workspace, we have channels, which if you think of like 90s chat channels, um, we've got these little forums, if you will, that are topical based on the goals or educational needs of learners. So if a tutor has a learner who wants to get their citizenship, then as a staff member, I can direct that tutor to the Slack channel on citizenship and they can crowdsource and talk with other tutors who are all doing tutoring on citizenship and they can look through past conversations on that channel to find resources for citizenship, to find articles that other tutors have posted, to find activities or even lesson plans that other tutors have posted. So one of our Slack channels is about corrections. And all of the tutors that have been tutoring and are tutoring in our jail program are connected to each other over that Slack channel and can talk about what their learners are working on, can share ideas together about what they might put in their packet this week. There, there have been a lot of discussions in the last few weeks on that channel. Um, to give you just an idea of how that works and another way that that comes together, there's been lots of discussion about how much should we be including in our packets with learners now that is about current news and all of the protests and the racial unrest and is that inflammatory in a correction system and just helping the tutors kind of talk through and work through all of those ideas so that we're doing the best we can for our learners. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Allison. And actually that takes us to uh, the top of the hour. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who need to leave, thank you very much for attending. And uh, just a reminder, uh, we're gonna be taking July off and you'll get a follow-up email on Thursday with a link to the recording of this webinar and um, uh, the PowerPoints and, and other resources. Uh, for those of you who want to stick around and listen to the responses to the remaining questions and the two folks that have your hands up uh, to share what you're doing, if you're able to stick around, we'll call on you uh, very quickly to share what you're doing. Uh, we're going to ask that you not submit any more questions because it is Friday afternoon for a lot of folks and we want to uh, be respectful of people's times. But uh, thank you very much for coming. You're welcome to stick around and hear what the panelists um, uh, say. And Robin and Patty, I know I said I was going to uh, let you guys answer, ask some questions, but I want to get our two other attendees that want to share what they're doing in their facilities, get them taken care of, and then um, uh, we'll go back to asking questions. Uh, so let's do Her Hernan or Hernan. Uh, and let's see.
I can get you unmuted. There we go. All right, Hernan, I think I've asked you to unmute. Can you unmute yourself? Let's see. Uh, Hernan is not unmuting. So let's try Natalie, where we're waiting on Hernan to figure that out. And Natalie, you are unmuted. Um, would you like to share what's going on in your uh, facility? Hello, yeah. Um, well, it was very interesting because I believe it was Allison Austin who was talking about how she's in a county jail. And um, I'm in a similar situation. I'm a teacher um, in New York in a county jail and we have very similar restrictions on technology. So I really like the idea she had about doing like recorded lessons and sending those in because I think that's something that we could work out in some way, shape or form. But one thing that we were able to tap into that might be helpful for other folks who are uh, in these facilities that have no technology or very limited is that we started using the televisit system. So our inmates or, uh, that are there have the ability to do televisits with their, you know, their family as they would a regular visit. And I'm not sure how many other facilities are equipped with this, but it's been a good way for us to sort of, um, we can, so we were able to make an account and go in and we meet with our students one-on-one, -on -one, which I know is a little more personal than I think we might be used to, but it's been a kind of a good working system for us because we've been sending packets in, the packet goes to an officer, the officer brings it, like we don't really know like what's getting to them, when it's getting to them and, and that sort of thing. So having the face-to-face -face meetup time, even just to kind of talk about the work and have their opportunity to ask us questions about the things that we've sent in, in lieu of class time, um, has really made a big difference. So I just wanted to maybe share if you guys have the televisit capability in your facility, it could be something worth looking into tap into to work with your students. Thank you, Natalie. That's a that's a great idea. Great suggestion. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to move you uh, back. And let's see if we can get her non unmuted. doesn't look like we're going to be able to. So let's go ahead and um, Patty, I think we'll turn it over to you to ask the next question of our panelists. Yes, the question was actually if um, Karen can expand a little more about the Oreo writing or the uh, Oreo method. There were some questions about that. I believe yeah, she answered so some much. individual chats, but yeah, it'll be great for everyone yeah, too. Thank you so much for the question. I did re, um, I did do a quick outline anywhere I saw that question. Um, I started using this uh, as a uh, public uh, middle and high school teacher because I was trying to get my students ready to write at the college level. Um, and I was also working on my master's and doctorate. So I actually, love this method. Um, it can be used in so many different ways. Um, its origination was for opinion writing. So the O would literally stand for your opinion statement. Uh, the R is reason one for your opinion statement. E is to explain and provide one piece of evidence for your opinion statement. And then you go to O where you can then create um, a closing. So it can just be as simple as one paragraph or you can do what I call the Oreo or your ER, which basically goes three to four paragraphs, but that's the format. So I use it as an opening statement, a reason for my opening statement, evidence for each statement, and then a closing. And so what you end up with is a cohesive three to four paragraph essay. But you just want to start with the basic one paragraph. And this just models for them. Now, what I'm not able to show you is that each um, letter has starter sentences if the student is low and really needs that ahead thinking. Um, so you, you would start with, and the videos that should be shared in the slides break this down beautifully for the, you know, for the lowest reader writer to the highest reader writer. Um, and this actually helped me in my own writing. Um, I consider the E to be where I have to provide the text evidence, the R, the reason, and the O is my statement. So 
just following that each and every time per paragraph helps them make those connections to that opening paragraph. Great. Great. Thank you. I think people will appreciate and uh, may go back and incorporate that Oreo uh, uh, writing structure in uh, their instruction. Uh, a couple of you have talked about um, sharing videos. Well, I think all of you have talked about sharing videos with, um, with your students, either creating videos and uh, sharing them in the sale blocks or uh, I think, Karen, you were talking about using the YouTube videos, which you guys have a, an internet connection. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're doing that, like how you're creating the videos, how you are getting them into the facility, and then how they're being uh, broadcast to the, uh, the inmates or the students in the uh, facilities? And I tell you what, let's start with uh, Tom or Olga first. And then I think we'll go again to Allison and then to Karen. Sure, thanks, Todd. Um, so in the Virginia Department of Corrections, what we have done is I've kind of coordinated several teachers. In fact, Geraldine, who you um, heard speak before, is one of them. Uh, myself and a couple other teachers out in our Western regions are creating educational videos uh, we do have an academy called the Academy for Staff Development where folks can go and record or we are using our own software to record them from our, from our, from our homes. They are then submitted uh, to a central person who runs them through a uh, software that adds closed captioning for ADA requirements. They're then sent to a, an approval committee that looks for sec any security issues, making sure everything is appropriate, that there is nothing that might violate any of our uh, security. Because in some of our videos um, are actually being led by some of our, our inmates. There are some uh, bilingual inmates be doing a Spanish lesson or something like that. So once that uh, all those videos are approved, they come back to our Academy for Staff Development we create physical DVDs and then snail mail them to the, the facilities. Each facility is uh, somehow equipped with a closed circuit television where we can play those DVDs in the pods or the day rooms. And they just kind of run throughout the day. Um, like I said, for those videos, we've partnered with the mental health services unit. So while there, there are some instructional videos going on, there's also some mindfulness videos, hygiene videos, things like that, and they run kind of on a TV schedule throughout the day. Um, again, supporting 43 facilities, it, it varies a little bit from building to building, but that's the general idea of it. Yes, so I would say that ours is similar in terms of what the actual facility has and what they're able to do. We are creating videos through software at home. People are using sometimes even just snippets off of their cell phone or we have done a number of um, videos that are essentially us recording Zoom meetings. And so we set it up like a Zoom mm -hmm. and then record that meeting to the cloud and then share the link with the person in the corrections facility who is our point person. And then that point person mm -hmm is the one that is taking care of actually broadcasting it over their closed circuit television process. But ours is, is super low tech in all of it. It is just what any of us have as individuals at home. And we're, you know, a small nonprofit. So it's a lot of using cell phones and Zooms and things. Low production quality, admittedly. And Karen, what about you? So I have a, I, I, sub, I created my own YouTube channel because I also give um, help to teachers for free. So, but there is a um, school tube where you can sign up for school tube uh, and that's for free for YouTube too. And then that you can run, um, make sure there's nothing really wrong with it. I just honestly have never really paid for YouTube. I just do everything I can for free. Um, I watch the videos first always, but I'm also like somebody else mentioned, I go to a, a admin through an admin at the hospital. All my um, PowerPoints are looked at first, um, but they've been working with me 
both in person before the pandemic and now for quite a while. Um, and they know how thorough I am in making sure that everything I show is appropriate and not going to be an issue. But um, they are there to check after me. And I never mind that because that's their job. And they, you know, they trust me, but they have to still do their job. So I really just try to find YouTube videos that don't take up much time, um, are free, and I just plug them into my PowerPoint. Um, somebody asked if I use the PowerPoint um, and Google Meets. There are times where I will re-show something through Google Meets that the big screen was showing as well. The thing with Google Meets is that you can't really see, I can't see the students and them really see me while I'm presenting through Google Meets. So I really try to keep the slide presentations for the staff to help me with present while I'm doing interactive work with the students. But I, there are times where I have to use Google Meets to reshow something from, from my Google Meets thing. I just, it, it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of communication with the staff and the camaraderie that you build is great. And I'm just plugging away. So yeah, school tube is free. You can register for that. Or you can just subscribe to create your own channel and that takes about 24 hours. Great, thank you. And I, I know there were some other questions about uh, YouTube and copyright usage. So I'm just letting people know that I'm gonna post a couple of links about uh, YouTube and fair use and copyright uh, restrictions to articles in the chat room. So Robin, go ahead with your question. Sure, so uh, we have a question. What platforms or systems are your various facilities using to secure the internet connection? This is Karen Davis. I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm not no. at the hospital. Um, that they have a library where the, the students could, and the other inmate patients could go in and use the computers, but they've limited that during the COVID, no one's really allowed to go in and do anything in a public place or touch anything. So they had two Chromebooks with the secure, their own secure website, and they use the Google Meets because it strictly goes through their secure settings that they've already preset. So, you know, that's why I send my PowerPoints ahead of time so they can make sure there's no, not going to be any issues with anything they send, but I'm, I'm pretty used to sending stuff now that I know what they can and can't open. Um, but I don't really know the actual um, system that they're using. I just know that they have the Chromebooks now that are you know, already kind of preset with what can and can't come through. Uh, this is Olga speaking for us. We are really don't have that much. That's the reason we're using the kind of like a television to to show it that way. We are looking on ways moving forward, but then is the bandwidth issues and there's a lot of things to consider. So we're kind of working with our uh, technology team as try to find out what maybe the new normal will look for. But at this point in time, just through the TV is what we have. Allison, do you have anything you want to add or are we set? Oh, no, I think you're set. Yeah, we don't have any control of what the facility has or does. So I wouldn't even know how to answer the question about how they're securing things at the facility end. Okay, I actually have another question. There was a question asked about if some of your tutors were the, um, if some of your inmates were your own tutors, but also I think it was answered by the chat, but does anyone expect any institutional resistance to peer tutoring? So I was just typing an answer to that in the chat, so I'm going to jump in. Um, we definitely have some, have had some resistance to peer tutoring, especially by some of the older corrections officers. I will say that we are extremely fortunate in that the sheriff and the leadership in our area is very dedicated to reform as part of corrections. And so if we have had any challenges, they have been shut down quite quickly from above. And so that's not been a persistent problem for us. 
All right, thank you. We have another question here, and, and forgive me if I don't get this acronym absolutely correct, but a question about whether any of your facilities are running an NCCER program? Uh, we are. The NCCER program is normally for our career technical, is, uh, career technical programs. Uh, so they do have to do necessary testing and um, provide what is the issue that we have right now because you do need to take the test you need to uh, prove pretty much what it is so that's a big challenge on the COVID-19 era uh, uh, so that's more of the career technical uh, that we do and what does what does the acronym stand for just in case there's uh, anyone else who's wondering besides me and I, I, you know, if you will not ask me, I will tell you right away, but uh, she just kind of caught me off, off, off guard. It's quite all right. I was normally works. Um, But it is normally, it, that's not the area that I normally work either because I am on the academic um, portion. Um, I will get back to you because I know, I know it is just, coming to me. Just give me a few minutes and I will tell you. Okay. And I think we've got one more question and then we'll be done. Um, so this was about uh, directed to um, Olga and uh, Tom, Virginia Corrections, but I think it, we can open it up uh, to the larger panel. <clears throat> so in terms of specifically uh, dealing with low literacy learners who need uh, work on like basic phonics and decoding skills and really uh, need personal support as opposed to being able to work independently with a packet. Um, how, are, how are you, um, uh, Olga and Tom, and really how are any of you kind of dealing with those uh, needs for lower level students? So what we're doing right now is depending on the student, there are some of our tutors live on the same wings and while they can uh, go out and to different places, they do have a common they can sit or so sometimes they have that kind of peer tutor, which is a kind of function. Uh, so they, if that is available, that's the way they do it. And then also the teachers are trying to be creative on using like, you know, uh, pictures and things of that nature. But it's been difficult, especially for the ESOL, uh, you know, for the second language acquisition, as well as your low level learner. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, and, and also with that, Dr. Lopez, as we're, that is a group that we are taking special consideration as we return to, or we begin our phased reopening as to who is gonna um, have access to the classrooms first and how we rotate, the, rotate those students around during the face-to-face -face instruction. That is definitely a group that we are uh, targeting, you know, those non-readers or very low-level readers is how can we get them the instruction that, that they need in order to build those reading skills. For us, that is who our videos are geared toward. So our videos are geared toward the lowest level student that we know is not going to be able to engage in a packet because their skills are still low. They're still at such an emergent level that packet really isn't going to work for them. And so all of the videos are at that lowest level and address the needs of that lowest level you know, albeit inadequately, it's the best we can do. It is working, it is helping, people are engaging, and that makes us happy. Great, great. And uh, let's see, Karen, do you have anything to add to that or? No, but I had someone ask for my channel. I sent you um, a cop like one of my videos if you could get to one of my videos you'll be able to get to all of them i don't use my college email for that because some of the work that i do is pro bono and um 
it's so I don't really like to, I don't have it attached to my college information. So I just went ahead um, and sent it directly to you via email for anybody that would like to. I'm continuing to grow and grow and grow. There's only a few on there, but I some of it was for my doctorate, some of it was to help other teachers. So sure. You know, it, I don't want anybody to go, well, I'm not, you know, famous or uh, <laughs> please don't, I mean, I'm, I'm making my own videos to help other people and to like practice doing this. So eventually I can throw out as much information. So please don't laugh too hard when you see it. <laughs> we, I think uh, one of the things that um, uh, we've learned about uh, uh, COVID is that very few of us are uh, you know, master filmmakers. So, um, uh, but we are all, I think, doing a, a great job of producing uh, valuable content. So thank you, Karen, for sharing that. And that wraps up our uh, questions. So let me thank you guys again, all of our panelists for uh, giving up your time and being willing to share uh, what you're doing in your facilities. We've got uh, great comments in the chats about how helpful this has uh, been for folks. So uh, thank you again and everyone have a great uh, rest of the day and a great weekend. Bye everybody. See you soon. Thank you so much. Karen Davis out. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.